what is this case all about? Well, this case concerns a decision of the Supreme Court regarding the legality of the detention of Jerry Adams in the 1970s. This took place during the times of what we call the Troubles, where there was lots of terrorist violence taking place in Northern Ireland. And what had happened was an interim custody order had been issued against Jerry Adams, and on the basis of this order, he was detained without trial, what we call being interned. He subsequently escaped, or tried to escape, on a few occasions, and was then charged with response to these offences of trying to escape from his interim custody order. Now, this all transpired in the 1970s, so you might be wondering, why is the case interesting now? Was Why was it only recently decided by the Supreme Court? Well, this was because 30 years later, evidence came to light that it may have been the case that the interim custody order was unlawful. Why was that? Well, it was because it hadn't actually been made by the Secretary of State himself. Instead, evidence seemed to suggest that this order had been made by someone else within the department of the particular Secretary of State, another official working in that ministry. Well, why would that be an issue? Well, normally it isn't an issue because we have a decision called Carl Toner. And this decision of Carl Toner basically sets out that normally if a power is given to a minister, it can be exercised by someone else. But the argument was made that Carl Toner should not apply here. And so because the internment order had not been made by the Secretary of State, this meant that it was unlawful. And that in turn would have meant that Jerry Adams' imprisonment had also been unlawful. So what is this Carl Toner principle? Well, Carl Toner all comes from a particular case which was involving the powers of different ministers set out in legislation, here specifically with regard to the ability to commission or requisition particular uh, buildings or factories. So the legislation in Carltona had said that the Commissioner of Works was able to requisition property. But the requisitioning of a particular factory had been made not by the Commissioner of Works, but by someone else, the Assistant Secretary, on behalf of the Commissioner of, of Works. So instead of the Commissioner of Works exercising this power, the Assistant Secretary working in that department had requisitioned the factory instead. So did this mean that it was requisitioned unlawfully? Lawfully. Well, Cartona tells us no, that's not the case, because powers given to ministers by legislation can normally be exercised by other responsible officials in that particular department. So the fact that this power was exercised by the assistant secretary wasn't a problem at all. So if that's the case, why was there even an argument that there was the interim custody order here was going to be unlawful? Well, Lord Kerr, when he looked at this case, said actually he didn't think Coltona could apply in this particular circumstance. And we need to ask ourselves, why was that? Why did the Supreme Court decide that in this case, Coltona does not apply? Well, there's a number of arguments that could have been made that Lord Kerr looked at. So first, the argument was, well, the reason Coltona shouldn't apply is because this is a really serious power. There are quite serious consequences of issuing an interim custody order. It means that somebody is being deprived of their liberty without even having a charge, just because they're suspected of terrorism. Now, Lord Kerr looked at that argument and said, well, that, that's not sufficient. We can't just say Coltona doesn't apply because there could be serious consequences of applying the power in this instance. A second argument that could be made was that it all depends on efficiency. So if there are not so many interim custody orders that it would be possible for the minister to issue them all himself, then surely that isn't a problem and that will mean that we don't need to have it delegated. There's no need for efficiency here. And again, Lord Carr wasn't willing to accept that argument either. What he did instead was he had a look at the specific wording of the Detention of Terrorist Northern Ireland Order 1972, which had given the power to the Secretary of State, and that's the wording that you have on this slide. 
And he looked at this and said, well, there seems to be a distinction between Article 4.1 and Article 4.2. So if we look at Article 4.1, it says, well, it's the Secretary of State that has to think that somebody is suspected of having been concerned in the commission or attempted commission of any act of terrorism or with regard to the direction, organising or training of purposes for the, pur persons, for the purposes of terrorism. And also, it's the Secretary of State that has to make the order. So far, so standard for Carl Toner. Well, surely that would mean others can make this too. But then if we look at 4.2, it says who can sign these orders. And they can be signed by persons other than the Secretary of State. And the wording says an interim custody order of the Secretary of State shall be signed by either the Secretary of State, the Minister of State, or the Under Secretary of State. And Lord Kerr looked at that and said, well, this seems very odd. Why do we have this distinction between Article 4.1 and Article 4.2? Surely there'd be no need for that distinction if Coltona applied. So because there was this distinction, and because Article 4.2 refers specifically to the interim custody order of the Secretary of State, Lord Kerr concluded that the Carl Turner principle could not apply here. It wasn't the case that any minister could make this. And he said this was backed up by the fact that this was something that was so serious that it amounts to a deprivation of liberty and because there wouldn't be so many interim custody orders that there'd be lack of efficiency in government if it was the case that the Secretary of State had to sign all of them. So that's the decision of the case. But why is it the case gets criticised? Well, there are two main types of criticism against the Adams decision. What we could say a specific argument and a general argument. And the specific argument is to look at the specific facts of the case and to say, well, actually, I don't think you interpreted this order correctly. So the criticism is that Lord Kerr didn't really look at the wording of the order correctly. And instead, the argument is made that when you think about this, there are already sufficiently important individuals who could sign the order. So surely they'd be able to make the order as well. Why is it they could sign it? couldn't make it. That just seems a little odd. And also the argument is that in reality, there might not have been all that many interim custody orders, but in the name of efficiency, you needed a wider range of people to sign them. Why? Well, because a minister would have to be working in Westminster and also travelling to Northern Ireland. And you'd need individuals in Northern Ireland to be able to be sufficiently aware of the situation to know whether they should sign or make an interim custody order or not. And also, there are all sorts of specific consequences of this decision. If it's the case that this interim custody order is unlawful, then surely that would mean when there are other facts that show that the Secretary of State hadn't made the order, then that would be unlawful too. And this could give rise to all sorts of consequences of unlawful imprisonment. Now, that's not an argument that's a specifically legal argument per se. It's not something the court should be thinking about when deciding the case. But nevertheless, it's something we should think about when criticising the potential consequences of that case. There are also general arguments about the case because we want to ensure there is efficient decision making in government and this means we normally understand Coltona almost as if it's a general statutory presumption. What we mean by that is that when we look at legislation we'll presume that Coltona applies unless there are very specific clear and precise words making it clear that the Coltona is not to apply in these circumstances and this promotes efficient and effective government. We all understand this is how it works. We all understand that government is working efficiently and effectively and we know there's sufficient political um, checks and balances because of ministerial responsibility and ministers are responsible for the actions of those in their department. So the criticism is that because Lord Kerr decided in the Adams case that there wasn't this general statutory presumption and instead you were just supposed to look at the specific wording without a presumption that Coltona would apply, then somehow this is going to undermine the efficient operation of government. Is that the case? Will it always do so? Well, let's take a step back and think about this. 
First, does it really make a difference? Because when we look at Lord Kerr's judgment, he says, well, there might not be a general statutory presumption that Carl Turner applies in every single circumstance. But nevertheless, we know that Carl Turner is a principle of the common law. We know that the legislature knows this too. So normally we will look at legislation against this backdrop anyway. So it doesn't really matter. In fact, Lord Kerr said on the facts of the case, regardless of whether you think there's a general presumption or not, you'd reach exactly the same conclusion. So his suggestion that there shouldn't be a general presumption against Coltona in this case might not necessarily make a huge difference. So it might not be worth really quibbling or questioning the way in which this was reached. Also, we could argue that really what this is, is a case on its own specific facts. It's because of the wording of the order itself that Lord Kerr reached this conclusion. He's not trying to make any kind of general comment or criticism about how work, powers work generally. So really, it's just a case on its own specific facts. It won't have all these large ramifications and knock-on consequences for other governmental powers. Finally, you could argue that perhaps not having a general presumption and having to look at the wording clearing and precisely is actually better. Why? Well, if you have a general presumption, then when you have individuals drafting legislation, they're going to draft legislation just granting powers to ministers. Any powers, including powers like the one in Adams, where you can use them to deprive individuals of liberty in quite serious consequences and circumstances. So if you could say Carl Turner only always applies, then it may well be that all these broad powers granted to ministers can be applied by anybody, including those that harm individual rights. But do we really want that? Because there might not always be sufficient checks and balances over individuals exercising those powers. Much as we have individual ministerial responsibility, it isn't always easy to make sure that ministers can be responsible for the actions of all of the particular officials in their department. If we don't have a general presumption, then it might mean that drafters have to think very carefully, particularly with regard to powers of ministers to deprive individuals of liberty, to set out clearly when we think the minister can exercise it and others can exercise it too, or when it's a power that can only be exercised by the minister. And when we think Carl Turner should apply, maybe there'd need to be clearer wording in legislation to that effect. That can bring it to the attention of MPs and maybe then MPs, when looking at legislation that's going to empower um, ministers in this particular way and perhaps their officials too, they can think very carefully about whether that's sufficient checks or balances. So that's just to give you an idea of Adams and why people argue. And in essence, what we're thinking about is how much power should be exercised by civil servants and are there sufficient checks and balances over those powers so we have a good balance between protecting liberties and also ensuring efficient and effective government. Thank you very much for listening.